Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borag Thung Athletes and welcome to the 2000 AD Thrillcast Lockdown Tapes. I am your host as always, Maltjar. Hope you're staying safe and well. On this episode, we're talking superheroes, but particularly British brand of superheroes. The Smash Special is out next week with uh, the revival of so many fantastic, classic British Heroes, and we've got uh, three creators talking about uh, their work on the special. And then later on, we're going to be talking about Grant Morrison and Steve Yowell's Zenith, the archetypal 2080 superhero. I feel. Um, first off, we're going to be talking to Helen O'Hara, who is a, a writer, a journalist, uh, works for uh, Empire Magazine. She's written the Thunderbolt Avenger strip for the Smash special. It's really great to talk to her about that. Then we've got, uh, well, they're practically regulars on the podcast now, Rob Williams and John McRae, who talk about their spider strip for the special, which I, for one, am very much looking forward to. Um, then we're going to talk to Abraham Reisman, who is uh, an American comic book critic and uh, journalist, uh, about uh, Zenith, which, uh, yeah, Morrison and Yoel's spoiled super rat of a superhero and uh yeah that that chat is really great there is one warning um with uh the chats with helen and with rob and john there are uh, so slight spoilers so if you want to go to the smash special completely cold then uh, probably best to set this episode aside and listen to it after you've got your copy it is available from 2080's web shop and apps on uh, next Wednesday the 27th of May um, but we're going to crack on now um, if you have any uh, ideas about guests or themes or strips that you would like us to look at on the Thrillcast drop us a line at thrillcast at 2080.com don't forget that the videos of these episodes go onto our YouTube channel which is um, youtube.com forward slash 2000AD um, like, subscribe all that bobbins. Uh, let's crack on and talk to Helen O'Hara about Thunderbolt, the Avenger. Do you want to introduce yourself? I, mean, like I, said, I, um, uh, I know your stuff from from Empire, but for those of uh, those of our listeners who don't who don't know you, do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, so my name is Helen O'Hara. I am pretty much basically a film journalist. Um, this is my first comic. That I've ever written um, and uh, and yes I'm editor at large for Empire magazine and write for a few other people and bits and pieces as well and have done a couple of little books so you know I'm just kind of basically anything anybody asks me if I want to do it my answer is usually yes let's try that let's give it a go well um I will apologize to our readers for the noise in the background the building work continues um uh, in that case tell us how you came to be working on Thunderbolt the Avenger Honestly, it was a it was a bolt out of the blue, if you will. I'm sorry, but it was a thunderbolt. Um, I, I literally got a message from one of the guys at uh, Rebellion Comics saying, "Would I be interested in in writing a comic?" And my initial reaction was abject terror, like complete utter. No, I can't possibly do that. I mean, I've started lots of fiction projects. I don't think I've finished any of them. So this was um, this was a huge, huge kind of task. But at the same time, it's one of those things. You know, if you're if you're that scared of something, that's usually a sign that you should actually try it and you should give it a go. Um, and I felt the same way when when someone asked me if I'd like to write a book. I was no, oh, God, no, I couldn't possibly. Um, but you know, it's it's a good thing to push yourself and it's a good thing to try new things. And I hope. It's not too terrible for the fans and the readers of the character because um, I certainly tried to, my best, but who knows? Honestly, I was I was kind of learning on the job. I was asking everyone I knew in comics for for advice and just you know uh, just trying to figure out how to do it. Well, tell us a little bit about Thunderbolt because um, uh, readers who picked up the the Vigilant series that mm. that, uh, that we've done a, a few comics of and we'll be wrapping up um, in the Judge Joe magazine. Um, it's a character that's appeared in there, but do you want to give us your own take on, on, on who Thunderbolt is? 
Yeah, I mean, it was sort of, there, there wasn't very much to go on in, in sort of what I was given. So I, I had a few of the original Thunderbolt comics and then, you know, just, just the Vigilant series where she's a character, of course, but she's not front and centre because it's a, it's a team effort, you know. Uh, so I was sort of trying to figure out a kind of a through line and trying to figure out a way to give a bit more, to, to find a balance really between the old Thunderbolt and the new to, to find a way that the power would have been passed from one to the new uh, one to the other um, and to find a way to kind of distinguish them a little bit in their approach to their powers um, because it's not it's not the same approach it's, it's not going to be the same attitude and, and you want to, her to have different problems than he did because otherwise well those comics have been written you know what's the point it it's gone from uh, Mick Riley, who who was always presented. I mean, number one, he was he was too short, and then he was too incompetent. But it was all a ruse mm -hmm. because secretly he was Thunderbolt, the uh, the Avenger. Exactly. Um, what what was your uh, kind of inspiration for uh, um, Mary Lanson, who, who who's, who's taken mm -hmm. over in terms of her origin story? Because the vigilant hadn't really gone into that. This 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 strip in the Smash Special is her origin story, effectively. Yeah. Um, what was your inspiration behind that? Well, it's it sort of, I mean, even in film journalism, I tend to be sometimes the only woman in the room or one of a small number of women in the room. So I was kind of looking at that as a, as a way to go, you know, what's it like being overlooked or, or undermined because you don't look like the other people, you don't look like the other guys. And I have friends who are in the police force and family members who are in the police force. And I think they find the same thing. It's still a very macho, masculine, environment and if you are you know as one of these people is a 20 something woman you really have to fight to prove yourself in a way that maybe a, an equivalent man would not so i kind of thought that was the obvious thing to do with her and it was something that makes sense it gives her a lot to work with um, and it also can play forward because she's still in a minority on the vigilant team as a woman so it still gives you something to kind of play with i didn't want to um close off anybody else's avenues to explore in the future. I wanted to give people hopefully some, some bits that they can kind of pick up on because apart from anything else, they, they discuss one of the ideas that they have coming up for Thunderbolt. So again, I wanted to kind of a very, very long kind of leave the door open to, to that. I'll say anything about what it is, of course, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was trying to, trying to not just give her a pass, but kind of open her up to a future and, and, and give that, texture there and and that's really really difficult I'm, I'm sure everybody else knows this and it's just me being inexperienced but to come into a character and, and in a very short space of time try to give the origin story which also kind of has to be a final farewell from Mick which also has to set up a little bit of her life before getting the powers but also her attitude to the powers you know that's a whole lot to try and fit in and I had to have a villain somewhere in there as well to do something threatening and bad so you know it's i i have no idea if i managed it but I, what i tried to do was kind of do several different things at once i uh, i think you you mentioned a, a minute ago um that, that you had read thunderbolt comics before um mm. what was your uh what was your take on on him as a character in his previous incarnations it's one of these things. Well, I like that he had real life problems. I think my favorite comic book characters tend to be those ones who have these issues to deal with and, and that where it's not easy to be a hero because I don't think it is in real life. I don't think it's easy to be a good person. I think it, it takes a lot of effort. Um, so, so I like that he had this continual push and pull between the two. I think it's very Peter Parker as opposed to Pete Parker, of course, uh, on the Vigilant team. Um, but he, I, I liked that he had that you know, conflict in him, I guess. Um, and so that was something that I think made sense. And of course, it was already established in the comics that he was often chucked in with the women and he had this relationship with, with Mary because she was also kind of left out of the, of the big important work. So that just gave me something to draw from for both of them and maybe an area where they could, could bond a little and could understand each other a little bit. Thunderbolt always struck me as, as um, in, the, in the kind of legions of, of uh, classic British superhero yeah. stories. He's actually been one of the more straightforward ones because, mm. um, you know, he's got the wristwatch, which is very yeah. important to his powers. <laughs> uh, it may, may, may as well be, a, you know, another piece of jewellery, a ring, for example. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it, it gives him powers and he, and, and he helps people. It, it, it's, it's less that kind of, um, has less of the quirkiness, 
I tended to yeah. find than uh, Leopard from Lime Street and, and some of the other um, uh, characters that, that are in this Smash special, like Steel Fall mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. Um, does, does that, in your eyes, make the character um, easier or, or more difficult to distinguish from the kind of mm -hmm. you know, straightforward American style superhero? Yeah, he did feel, he felt of his time. Let me put it that way. When I was reading those kind of classic Thunderbolt comics, like he just felt, it, it felt like all those kind of early Peter Parker Spider-Mans, that was the one that really stuck out to me as a, as a kind of point of comparison. But, but he really was pretty straight ahead. You know, the, the power is, you know, vaguely scientific, but let's face it, terribly undefined. And, and that's kind of a, a hallmark of those classic comics as well. And, and, you know, it did tend to be similar-ish plots, at least in the ones I've read. I haven't read everything, but, um, but yeah, so I, I, I think he could maybe do with a little bit more, uh, I don't know, a, a, something a little bit more to, to distinguish Nick. And I hope that, that going forward that Mary gets a little bit more to kind of play with that way. And, and I trust that she will, just because I think comics have evolved a lot. And I think the writers that they have are going to take that forward and, and do crazy new things with her. So I think that's really exciting. But but I do think you need to kind of push the envelope a little bit, you know. Um, it's not just enough to say, oh, no, I'm late to my job. And that's your whole kind of dramatic tension, you know. We've all been late to our jobs, dude. It's going to be fine. I love the fact that there was a time limit because obviously it's a watch. So there's a time mm. limit on these powers, um, which I think was two hours. And then later on, it went down to one when, uh, yeah. I, you know, writers probably realized two hours is actually probably a lot of time if you're just kind of flying in and have superpowers to, to, to solve something. It, it, but yeah. it's, it's that kind of quirkiness that I love about that, that, <laughs> that age of, of superheroes. Mm. Uh, is, is, there, is there anything um, weird that you'd like to do with, with a character like Thunderbolt? Well, I'd, I'd just be intrigued as to what, you know, how you play around with those powers, I guess. So, you know, and like you say, I was kind of trying to think about the hour time limit and was there anything cool I could do with that? And why, why is he going to? And, and then I had a whole much bigger action sequence planned out where they have to fly a whole round, a whole area and fight a bunch of people in different places so that that would come more into play. Um, but I had also had seven pages and I wanted to do a bit of character work. So I was I was really, really torn. Um, but yeah, it's it's something that should be, I think, mission is, and I would really like a bit more consideration and, and discussion of, okay, I can just about buy that this sort of weird electricity going through your body makes your muscles stronger. I can, that's, there's got some vaguely scientific leanings in that, that's fine. I'm not sure how it helps you fly. That, that's a bit of a stretch. Um, and I, I'm obviously not objecting to that because flying is cool, but, you know, it, that, that seems a little bit, more pseudoscientific than than the rest let's be honest let's talk a little bit of, of, about british superheroes in general because one of the the joys of of uh, us having the ipc archive is all these weird and wonderful characters who um as you say very much of their time but mm. there's such there's so much quirkiness to them there's so much uh, that's interesting that's different that isn't just straightforward you know spandex um, mm. stuff uh, as I've said on a previous episode of the podcast, my favourites where it's the bad guy being foiled by a couple of small children because he's trying, trying to disrupt the church fate. Um, Amazing. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I kind of want to bring this into to thinking about your experience of, of um, writing about movies and mm. how we perceive superheroes now and, and, and whether resurrecting these traditional British mm. superheroes um, is a worthwhile exercise when they are now so ubiquitous in our culture. Oh yeah, I think it definitely more maybe more now than ever. I mean, look, I love all the anyone who knows my work at Empire knows I love the American superheroes as well. And, and you know, I've loved all those Marvel the, the films pretty much almost all. Um, I've I've loved a lot of the DC work. So I'm I'm grateful that we have all of that. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. And it would be great actually to see this kind of superhero era giving us a little bit more to play with and a little bit more quirkiness, as you say. I feel like it would be great to see more regional variation, including the UK, you know, um, away from this American idea, because I feel like the superhero is a quintessentially, originally American myth. Like it seemed to displace or replace the Western in the kind of American mythology of itself. And, a lot of that then shapes the superheroes that we get, but superheroes are not purely American anymore. And I think that, you know, British comics have really shown that and, and British comics have always been different and weirder 
and and out there i mean obviously judge dread but not only him you know how do you have a celtic god as your you know, the hero of your comic all this kind of stuff it's it's far different and it should be and, and the, the genre should have room for all of that um so i, I would kind of like to see you know a, some british producer decide to just throw money at it and just make something crazy and weird i mean dread was brilliant dread was really good this stuff can work on the big screen you just have to find the right way in so, I, I mean we've discussed it on the podcast before but there's, there's, there's a kind of uh, gothic nature to a lot mm. of the, the the sort of uh, comics of the 50s well well before then but 50s yeah. 60s and 70s um a, 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 a darkness to a certain extent and it's interesting in the context of um, the writing that's been done about the American monomyth and how that mm. relates to superheroes. Um, and then it, it's not necessarily that there's a re-exporting back, but when you see British creators riffing off superheroes, there's always that element of darkness. There's always that element yeah. of deconstruction, you know, mm -hmm. not, not just the work of someone like Alan Moore, but uh, yeah. Grant Morrison, John Wagner, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they um, there's a lack of, uh, what's the right word? trust yes i, I think, think that's the, true yeah in these gods who walk uh, yeah. walk among us so it's really telling i think i think to be honest that comes from our culture a little bit like america hasn't really ever i mean until vietnam had never lost a war really and they didn't have that idea of themselves and i think that the last hundred years uh for the for britain has been losing wars and even when they won they lost the empire and they lost territory and they lost control and they realized that having just fought a war against Nazi domination, they couldn't continue to dominate parts of the world and, and they you know, gave in to the, to the nationalist movements there. So I think that shaped our consciousness. I think finally, well, I used to think finally that Britain had bought some element of self-doubt, which I think is a very important thing to have sometimes. I think it's sometimes you want a little bit of self-doubt, it's healthy. Um, and America hadn't really. Now, the last couple of years since Brexit have slightly, you know, stretched my belief in that respect. But I, I do think that we are a little bit more nuanced um, and shows in the way that we treat our heroes as well. We're a little bit, not cynical, but maybe wary of the individual great man theory. Um, and so that kind of shapes the great men that we write, or women. It's, it's uh, it, certainly interesting in... in um in terms of the, the, the class structure within Britain, mm. again, this is something we've discussed. In yeah, the yeah. Class. But um, in America, where um, money is, I guess, effectively the, the, the class structure, um, but where you have um, a president who is meant to be first among equals, mm -hmm. it's meant to be a flat system. And I'm not going to go and <laughs> talk about that any further because um, we'll, 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 uh, we've already mentioned the B word. We'll, we'll end yeah, up yeah. The Sorry. Word in a minute. Um, but uh, in, in Britain, the class structure, um, as you say, makes us wary because mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're used to there always being people above us trying to tell us what to do. Whereas yeah. in America, there is not a naivety, but, but um, yeah, well, a trust. There, yeah, a, 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 but there is, you're right, there's a myth that they don't really have class. And, and they kind of acknowledge it in some ways, like, again, I'm sorry, I sound like a broken record, but Peter Parker is always struggling for money. You know, some of those heroes are struggling for money, but it is far more usual for them to be a billionaire. I feel like there are more billionaires than there are people struggling for a paycheck. Um, and that's not, you know, a realistic portrait of society, guys. That's not how it works. Um, so, yeah, so I, I do think that plays into it. I think a lot of our comics are a bit more... Um, ground level i mean certainly you know again dread but all of the, lots of the alan moore stuff is people struggling to get by and struggling to make ends meet and i think that play and, and and that kind of sense of underworld and that sense of kind of grubbiness that you get in some of the best british british comics i, I think the americans don't like to acknowledge it doesn't fit their mental self-image sometimes well i see I, I i think one of the criticisms i've read about um the Marvel movies, for example, yeah. is is the uh, how quickly they move on to the action for obvious reasons. For, for sure. um, but there's the you don't really necessarily get a sense of the day to day life for people who have sec meant to have secret yeah. identities. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've pretty much done away with secret identities in the Marvel movies. I, I think they made that decision pretty much at the end of the first one, um, and and I think it's been interesting because. Uh, I mean, even now, I mean, spoiler for Spider-Man Homecoming, or Far From Home here, but 
they've now revealed Spider-Man's identity and he was the one guy still in the closet because he's a freaking teenager. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that develops going forward. But I, I think, I think that was probably the right decision for Marvel or for, for the MCU, just because, um, it's been done to death on screen because those scenes are cheaper to shoot. I think the real world stuff. Um, and I'm not sure once you have a world where all of these superheroes are happening, you know, it's not one hero anymore. It's all of them. Then maybe the need for a superhero for a secret identity becomes less, I guess. Um, so it's been interesting that they've, that they've so thoroughly turned their backs on that because it does give you something else to play with. It does give you that kind of, Oh, how do I get back in time for my bar mitzvah or whatever, um, which is kind of fun sometimes, but I, I yeah, it's been, it's genuinely weird to me that they, they so thoroughly dismissed it so immediately and have never looked back. It, I, it was something I, I noticed, uh, and we will come back to talking about Thunderbolt in a second. <laughs> um, it's something I noticed in, um, uh, was it Endgame? Mm -hmm. uh, how quickly, uh, in any moment, their, their um, hoods come back, you know, their, their kind mm. of nanotech hoods. Yep, yep. Like, as soon as they stop moving, it reveals their face. For again, very obvious reasons, those are the money makers. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, you're not going to spend all that money on, on Robert Downey Jr. and then not see Robert Downey Jr., my God. Exactly, exactly. They, they, they all come into that final battle, and spoilers for anybody who's, who's not seen the movies, but they come into that final battle with Thanos, and they all kind of touch down, and every single one of them immediately takes off their protective hoods. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Anyway, but in the context of this, let's, let's mm. come back to talking about Thunderbolt, because... Um, he's a police officer mm. and you've decided, like I said, you decided to make Mary Lanson a, 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 a police officer as well. Mm. Does Thunderbolt say something about uh, our relationship with the police? Because uh, the, the, mm. there aren't really, I'm trying to think of any American superheroes that are police officers in their normal life. In their normal life. I know that can... Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, sure people. Like must be. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Everyone's shouting at, at names at the uh, at the device right now. I can't think of any off the top of my head either. Uh, but I do think it, it is interesting. Yeah, I think it's interesting to have that duality. Oh, um, no, never mind. She's not. She doesn't have superpowers. I was thinking of the, of the one from Birds of Prey, Renee. Um, Toya. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but I don't think she has superpowers, so it doesn't count. But yes, I do think there's an interesting thing here because the point of a police force, and some people are going to disagree with me, but the point of a police force is not to have a paramilitary organization that follows its own rules. The powers of the police should be carefully uh, circumscribed. They should be carefully limited, and they should only act within those limits. And I think that's something that distinguishes, say, the British police from sometimes some of the American police um, who tend to be a little bit more literally shoot first and ask questions later. Um, and I think that's something that, that is good and that is right and that you want um, in a police force. I'm Northern Irish, uh, so I grew up in uh, an environment where we did not instinctively trust the police. I'm a Northern Irish Catholic and my community was not... In, encouraged to trust the police uh, not least because they often arrested us for no reason uh, my dad was arrested twice when um, before i was born when he was a teenager um literally from being in the wrong place at the wrong time uh, he had done absolutely nothing wrong and no charges were brought and everything else just just to be clear um but that is the context you know some some communities are over policed some communities are un unfairly picked on some communities do not grow up seeing the police as a protective element and so if you're going to have a police person who is also a superhero, I think you have to have someone who is going to be also wary of who the police are and what they should do and, and how far they should go. Um, and, and so that was kind of like, I've tried to put a line in there and I hope I've expressed it well enough that Mick doesn't necessarily trust just anyone on the force with this power. I think if you gave it to them and they put it in the riot gear room for use in emergencies, you know, I think bad things would happen. So you want someone who's got that wariness and who's got those reasons to side with the underdog or understand the underdog to have a power like this, if such a thing existed. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because I've written a lot about 
Judge Dredd as mm. uh, uh, as a metaphor, as um, a, a prediction to a certain extent. And one one of those aspects is is how um, as you go through the seventies and the eighties, mm. public perceptions post Brixton, post yeah. um, Toxteth, and post Orgreave begin to change. So the the, the the police are no longer necessarily seen by the uh, sections of the general public as being community bobbies people yeah. who are there to protect they're seen as an arm of the state yes uh, in a way that they haven't necessarily done before and and certainly alan grant as a writer is somebody who's absolutely on board with that perception mm -hmm. um you can see his influence over there so it's, it's interesting in, in in the context of um a superhero who is a policeman who has that absolute power but as you say distrusts people who uh, supposedly should be on the same side it, it mm. that, that that feels very british in its perception. yeah I, I hope so I, I think so i mean i i still remember coming over here to university and seeing policemen walking down the street in those big tall hats you know the very traditional british bobby's hat obviously, yeah they never wore those in northern ireland obviously for obvious reasons um and they you know and they were just kind of walking along the street and and that was cool and everybody was smiling and that was fine but it was weird to me i, rem I still remember how weird that was so I, I feel like i've tried to get a sense of that in there no not always I, i'm not saying that mary is without you know uh, dimension in that way i think she i think if you're a police officer if you're on the force if you're hearing this all day in and day out you start to absorb some of the of the attitudes that you know sometimes people are out to get you and sometimes you do have to be tough and some people deserve a punch or whatever else um so i, I think there's a little bit of that in in her as well but I, but i don't think it's the overriding sense i don't think it's the overriding factor um in the way that it might be for some of the big tough cops who really see it as their you know world uh, with um with an origin story now mm. coming back to, to what we were talking about with um uh american superheroes with with, with, with with the movies uh one thing that of course marvel decided to do was not to retell the origin story of spider-man when they brought him back mm -hmm. into the, the, the yeah. movie. but this but this thunderbolt story is very very much a, a, an origin story um mm. do you think that that was um important because it it really gives uh, and I've got a kind of supplementary question to this in a minute. Okay. Uh, it gives Mary legitimacy. She's not just appearing as Thunderbolt. Mm. There, there is actually a reason why she is the one with the watch. Yeah, I think I think because it is an item, it is a thing that is that you have. There has to be a reason she has it. So either she stole it, or he gave it to her, or it was abandoned somehow and she came across it. Now the third one just seems kind of boring <laughs> to me, perhaps wrongly. Um, I, I guess, you know, he could have moved abroad and left it somewhere and she could have discovered it, but I'm not sure why any of that would happen. And I, I you know, I didn't feel like there was enough there. Um, having it start with her stealing it would be interesting, but I'm not sure it would send the right message about the kind of person that she is, because I think she is a hero. And, you know, I'm all for giving some color and some nuance and some depth to that but I, I don't think your hero necessarily starts with a theft especially from a colleague and someone that you know she worked with for a long time so then it was going to be him giving it to her in some fashion and then it was a question of well how and why would he do that and why would it be her and not someone else and and those are the kind of questions I tried to come up with answers for in the script I'm, I'm not saying I've reinvented the wheel here but I was kind of because I felt those those original mixed scripts were so classic that I was trying to keep it quite classic, to be honest. And and again, comic readers may find that just you know terribly boring. I don't know, but I hope not because I really tried to give it something that would tie these two eras and these two characters together and and just make it feel like a handover and like a like a continuation of one character called Thunderbolt and not just another person who happens to have the same watch. There, there was uh, an awful lot of controversy, a lot of the screaming and shouting when um, uh, Jane Foster became Thor in yeah. uh, Jason Aaron's uh, run a few years ago. Um, and the issue of uh, changing the uh, gender of yeah. uh, established superheroes is, is 
um, one of, on which a lot of people have very strong opinions. Mm. Um, were, were you conscious of that when, mm -hmm. uh, when creating this origin story? I, I was. I mean, it had been done for me, so I didn't have to make the choice, uh, first of all. So that was uh, probably good. <laughs> um, but I think it, it, it's interesting. I have, I have a lot of thoughts on this. I've actually been writing about this subject a little bit recently. And so the problem, I think, is, and, and people can feel absolutely free to disagree with me, um, but I think we're living in a world right now which is very dominated by existing brand names, what they call IPs, intellectual properties. And that makes it easier to sell your film if you can say, I've got a new take on Sherlock or I've got a new take on Tarzan. That's an instantly easier thing to sell than saying, I've got this fabulous story about a dude in a jungle. You know, so everybody wants to minimize risk because these films, even a medium sized film costs so much to make nowadays. This, I'm talking, I'm coming at this from a film angle rather than a comic angle, of course. Um, but in these films, everything takes so much money to make. And so you are best to bet on something that already has brand name recognition built in because that is the way that you can get your thing made. Now, the problem is that all of these things, or an overwhelming number of these things with brand name recognition, were written 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago. And if that's all we do, or if that's a, a major part of what we do, you're going to keep seeing the values of 30, 40, 50, 100 years ago replicated over and over and over again on the screen. So we're going to keep seeing straight white men, great people, love them but straight white men over and over and over again to the detriment of seeing really any other options. So, you know, it's not that I think that gender swapping is necessarily the answer. Obviously it would be wonderful if everybody was able to make fantastic original ideas all the time. And if enough of those succeeded so that it was economically viable for that to be the principal method of film and media production. But realistically, people are getting much more excited about a new Batman film than they are getting about a new, well, even a Judge Dredd film. And he's a really established character. So the bigger names still dominate to this huge degree. And if all of those names, pretty much all of the ones I've mentioned so far, are straight white men, then what do you do? I mean, you know, you've got Wonder Woman sit among the sort of cast iron Golden Age characters as Wonder Woman. There's nobody else there. And we need more than just Wonder Woman. So I'm not saying that gender swapping is necessarily the answer. I think there are clever ways around this. I think there are other things we can do. Um, but if we're going to rely to such a great degree on these massive existing properties, and I'm not just talking about comics and, and books, but also like remaking all the films of the 80s, which we seem to be doing, then we need to figure out ways to make it more interesting. We need to figure out ways to make things more diverse because once you put a new character with new problems and new life experiences and new perspectives into the same situation, have them are facing the alien or the Terminator, but have a completely different life experience behind them, that's going to be a more interesting film, I promise you, than just seeing Arnold Schwarzenegger again. Um, so that's the aim, I think it has to be. If we're going to keep relying on IPs, we have to find clever ways to mix it up. Um, and while gender swapping is not the only answer, I think it's one of the components that might make things more interesting. Because honestly, guys, you don't want it always to be a white man. You will love it, I promise, if you open your mind sometimes to some other possibilities. That's one of the interesting things about having this huge archive full of these characters is um, the opportunity not just to continue what was happening before mm. also to, to to take things on and you know it's up to the editors and the writers yeah. um to 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 do that um but I, I always find it interesting when 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 you see um when we've been publicizing the specials that we've been doing like the vigilant like mm. um uh, even even something as simple and straightforward as core buster um there are still voices who say, well, why don't you just reprint the old things? Or why don't, you know, why don't you just do the same thing? And it, it's, it, and it's interesting people's um, uh, differing attitudes towards things like existing IP. Yeah. That some people just, you know, and, and that's absolutely fine. Some people just yeah. want more of the same and that's great. Whereas other people, th there's diminishing returns in that sometimes that you think. Mm. I think there is. I think just doing the same thing over and over again. Um, look, there is nostalgia value in that sometimes. And certainly there are some 
comic book strips I've picked up because it was a reprinting of an old one that I never read at the time, 100%. And that's also how I started kind of getting my comic um, literacy, really. It, it was because I'd read them so haphazardly. I started getting those big, um, you know, ultimate collections and essential collections and things like that, just to kind of read through lots at once. Um, so I'm absolutely not saying we shouldn't do those. But again, doesn't it get boring doing the same old thing? And And isn't there a hunger and an appetite among true fans to just mix it up and just see something new and see elements of the thing you love kind of remixed in a new way. I mean, it's, it's like music in that sense. It's like a remix. It's taking maybe the beat that made you dance and adding a new, you know, lyric over the top. There's no reason that can't work. It might not in every case, and I'm not saying it would, but it's worth trying, I think. Um just coming back to, to one of the things that we were talking about at the very beginning was about um, mm. the, the fact that this is your first comics work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I just kind of want to uh, explore a little bit about how, how you found the process mm. of, um, number one, writing fiction. Number two, doing it. I, I, I always think it's really interesting with, with, with comic writers, particularly ones who don't necessarily have an awful lot of experience, is that you're essentially writing blind to a certain extent mm -hmm. yeah you know, the, you know you, uh, um, a lot of writers say they have a vision in their mind of what they want so they write yeah. it down but then you're trusting another human being or in some cases two two or three human yeah. beings to translate that so i wanted to get your perspective on on how you found that that was kind of terrifying actually because you're you're trusting someone else to understand whatever half incoherent thoughts you're giving them and and i was trying to give them really clear detailed thoughts and trying to really think it through and, and think about what would work on the page and how many panels there should be on the page and and how the flow would work and how to you know how you'd read through um without also wanting to stifle their creativity like i don't i want to give them room to come up with things so there were some things where i was like okay the idea i have is something like this but if you can do better please please do because you know Frankly, I'm not an expert, obviously, um, and, and my artist is. So that's part of it. Um, I definitely wrote overly long captions and overly lo long dialogue because I was trying to cram too much in. So that had to be significantly kind of trimmed down. Uh, and that, again, a learning process. The biggest thing was just the structure. The biggest thing was trying to figure out how to tell the beats that I thought really had to be in there in the available space and how to, you know, introduce one character really a new at least and give another character the send off that I hope he deserves and introduce a villain to challenge them both and have an incident that would require you know some daring and some action and some excitement and and do it all in again this this limited space so I, I it, it turns out it's really difficult and my already quite high respect for comics professionals has gone through the roof as a result um, so yeah, it's been, it's been really, really fun. It was a massive challenge. Uh, and I apologize now to anyone who thinks I didn't do their characters justice, but genuinely I, I loved doing it. And I, I thought it was a really, I'm so glad I was asked. I'm so grateful. Has it given you a hunger for more? Um, yes, but I feel like I'd have to practice a bit more first. <laughs> I feel like I need to, um, to really kind of try and come up with some, some, different scenarios, different stories, and, and try and figure out a way to really, really boil them down to their bones and, and kind of make them work. So I've got a different nonfiction piece that I'm working on at the moment. Once that's done, I really kind of do want to kind of train myself a little bit and, and, and practice a little bit and think a bit more about how to do it because it was, it was a great, great experience, yeah. <laughs>Oh, well, thank you to Helen for that fascinating chat about superheroes. Now, Rob Williams and John McRae, as I said, are practically regulars on the podcast now um, a few times. So uh, it, but it was great to be able to connect with them and talk about the spider, which is a, a character, uh, which is one of the archetypal British superheroes, not just a, a superhero, also a supervillain and uh, a unique design. And uh, it was great to be able to talk to Rob and to John about uh, reviving this uh, all-time classic superhero. Um, Rob, do you want to kick us off and, 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 and explain to those who don't know who the spider is? Uh, the spider is sort of the 
the greatest supervillain that ever was, and certainly believes himself to be that. Anyway, he's a, he's a me he's one of those fantastically entertaining megalomaniac, ranty who dares types um, who, like PJ. much like PJ Holden uh, <laughs> of the 2000 AD Parish. Um, uh, and um, he is a master of hypnotism. He is a master of technology. He is a master of everything. And he started out as a supervillain. And then as the kind of bonkers stories went on, he, he eventually came around to the side of the angels. But it kind of, I think he's sort of, he can go either way, put it that way. Um, and he's just fun to write because he is the most arrogant man alive. And the most arrogant man alive, much like PJ Holden, is um, a, a very entertaining Behave. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's um. So we, we, yeah. What did we do? An eight pager, John, wasn't it? We were asked to do eight pages, so it was kind of like trying don't, to don't ask, me, don't ask me, Bob. Because I kept yeah. getting that one wrong, didn't I? Um, yeah, well. yeah. But uh, yeah, I think it was eight pages. Oh, by the way, Rob, I think you went over your Brian Bolland limit word limit there. Look what's <laughs> I think happening. You're allowed to do that. <laughs> um. But um, yeah, anyway, good fun and uh, eight pages and in, in, introduce him to a new world um, to, the, to see if a spider works in modern day comics in a contemporary feel. And, um, and he, I think he does really, because he's just so large of a life. I think you could drop him in any, anywhere and I think he'd still, um, he, he, he'd still sort of like pop off a page really. He's just one of those really large of a life comic characters that we've um, we kind of grew up reading this still fun today yeah 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 no he was terrific fun uh to draw uh your script was great a lovely little done in one and uh yeah he's he's visually great fun to sink your teeth into uh and yeah, villains are always better aren't they really so much like pj he does, he, he does look like a villain i mean he kind of he's got the point you know it's not pj now this is the spider we're referring to um, um really um, oh right okay but no he's got he's it, it'd be tough to see him as a hero you know but um he kind of he's got the look of a old hammer house of horror kind of vampire or something along those lines really yeah 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 i mean i i really enjoy the look of him um and I was really influenced by the uh, the original artist, but also by Gary Leach, who um, did one of the, my favorite images of the spider when Titan did a reprint of the spider, and Gary did a uh, did a cover for it, um, the King of Crime book that uh, the Titan released, and uh, it's a, it's a great looking image, of course, being Gary. Uh, so I was as much influenced by Gary's interpretation as I was by the original artist whose name eludes me because I've got a brain like a sieve. The um, host of our podcast will know. Reg Bunn. That's him. Thank you. How can I forget Reg Bunn's name? That's mm. it's not a forgettable name. So did you did you grow up reading The Spider then, John? I bought the Vulcan when I was a wee nipper. I picked it up from my local corner shop. Uh, back in Northern Ireland, home of the Troubles. And I used to have to make my way past the burnt out cars and the graffiti daubed <laughs> end tables. Make my way listen to this, he doesn't understand the why. Past I... the soldiers and the armor lights and <laughs> generally through the horror of it to my local corner shop to get my uh, copy of the Vulcan, which had the spider in it. Yes, so I did pick it up. The Vulcan got published for about a year. So... I, I, I picked up as many issues as I could get. I think some, some of the shipments might have got blown up, possibly by the IRA or by the UDA. Who can say? If, if, if anybody listening to this who is confused as to uh, why John is uh, uh, talking so much about the troubles, Brian Bolland uh, referenced the fact that the subject came up quite organically in both John and... I thought I was being completely organic there, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> don't create feuds on my podcast it was rob's idea it's always rob's idea <laughs> he said it on facebook <laughs> <laughs> don't blame me i'm just an innocent bystander in this i grew up in south wales where there were very few troubles as far as i'm aware of course of course troubles with um, sheep 
So with uh, coming back to the subject in 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 hand, uh, so co-created by Ted Cowan and, and Reg Bunn, the, it, the the spider is one of those characters. You know the whole thing about uh, um, how comic book characters should be recognisable by their silhouette. Sure. You know, it's, it's one of the things that um, uh, that the, the Dread really does nicely in in the is is a complicated design, but you know exactly what you're looking at. The spider kind of is as well because of that that wonderful contraption that he he straps himself to it, it it's so kind of almost victorian kind of tesla uh, you know tesla like um device on him um yeah. does does that slow down this silhouette for you as an artist john or 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 is it just a nice little kind of contrast to because it, it, the rest of him is just in like a sleek black onesie yeah yeah no it's the it's the ears and that and the, the, the sort of tubes and the gun. I mean, he has got a great silhouette to work with. Yeah, he's a, he's a good looking character, um, well designed. I mean, the, the sort of chest contraptions are unusual to say the least, but mm. you know, it's, it is what it is. And I think if you draw it appropriately, it works. So yeah, no, I mean, he's visually a great, a great character to work on. I mean, I was pleased as punch when I was asked to work on on the spider. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no complaints from me there about about that. Reg Bunn did the work. He did the job. And he is he is human, isn't he? Because he kind of looks like he might be big. He's got pointy everything really facially, hasn't he? Is you know, that ever kind of... established whether he's alien or human or vampire or? I mean, he's just a. He's just a villain, isn't he? He's just a he, bad guy. He, yeah. couldn't, he couldn't look more villainy, really, could he? Uh, I guess they but, uh, wanted to make sure you knew. Yeah. With, with this, as you said, he was a criminal who ended up hunting criminals. Um, mm. But, uh, you know, there are going to be spoilers in this podcast. So, spoiler, um, you've definitely gone for the spider is a criminal. In yeah, because that's more it was way more fun than him hunting criminals, um, and also I mean, you know, we didn't have a lot of space in, like, say, in terms of eight pages to try and tell a little self-contained thing which reintroduces him to the world and isn't horribly filled with exposition. So setting up a story with like, where's he been? What happened to him? He vanished, and no one's seen him for years. And then a message comes down uh, to the British government from uh, a society of supervillains who basically say, we know where the spider, what happened to the spider, that he's been trapped on a secret um, prison in the middle of the North Sea. And we're going to release him unless you give us whatever it is, two billion pounds or uh, MacGuffin A, basically. Um, and so um, uh, the British government turn around to... Um, one of our lead characters and says, well, he's, he's still there, right? They can't release him. And she goes, I'll go and check. And then you find uh, out in the, what happened to the spider. And he is, um, and, and you know, well, no, what can I say? Well, giving too much away. Um, no, yes, more. It, no more is probably a good thing. He doesn't eat anyone, put it that way. He's not a cannibal in this story. I believe there was a reiteration of him where he was a bit cannibally. I, don't... I was going to bring that up because that was the action special in the early 1990s. And uh, I think right. it was, was it Mark Miller who made him like a, a psychotic Hannibal-esque right. uh, character. I'm guessing you're not a fan. I haven't read it. I mean, I must admit. But I, other people, when, I, when it came out that we were doing it, I did get a few. I hope you, he's not a cannibal. It was like, oh, okay. So, um, no, I kind of, with these kind of things, I think you're foolish to kind of, you know, we said the look of him is so good and just the overall kind of his strength is that bombastic, arrogant melodrama. So to try and kind of file off the edges and make him something sleek in 2020 would be a bit dumb, really, because everything that's exciting about the character is what he originally was. So I just thought now he's 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 very much a baddie. And quite yeah. cross by the end of his story, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> yeah, you know, he has good reason, I suppose. I mean, he, I, he I like Mark. Mark is a good writer, but, you know, I didn't read the Cannibal story and I got that message too. When it was announced, uh, there were a lot of people saying, don't do the Cannibal thing. And It's, uh, one, of, it's one of the major issues of the day, if people are constantly saying that. Yes, 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 especially now. 
now yeah more so than ever <laughs> what's going on <laughs> exactly yeah you know do i socially isolate or do i eat this person yeah exactly. but, um but no it's um yeah he, he, you could do a lot more with him i think he's got a lot a lot of mileage he's just um i think he kind of fits so i don't know whether or not rebellion would see fit to do that but um i could see more spider stories i'd love to draw him again He's good fun, yeah, yeah. but the but the yeah. character I really, really, really want to draw more than every anything is the Leopard of Lime Street. That's that's the character I'm absolutely gagging to draw. So is it, I would is I, he, if if you if you had asked me to to name the character that you were yeah. desperate to draw, I would not have said the Leopard from Lime Street. No, I I know you wouldn't uh, yeah, think that, but I recently picked up the reprints and I remembered Leopard from when I read, when I read it originally and uh, I reread the reprints and I read them just like that, re roared through them, enjoyed the hell out of them. It was just like being a kid again, such a good character, such a great backstory. I mean, he's the British Spider-Man. I mean, literally Rob, he was bitten by a radioactive leopard. So, you know, it's, it's down to that, but uh, great character, Lovely artwork. I'd love to have a shot at him. So, yeah. But Spider would do nicely. Spider versus the Leopard of Lime Street. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> it could work. Well, didn't, didn't um, J. Mark Krasinski do what? that whole thing the with the Lime the avatars yeah. of, uh, of the animals in Spider-Man? So you could have le leopards versus spiders and... Uh, I, di I didn't read that run. I didn't yeah. read that. You might be right. No, was, that when, was that when Ramita Jr. was drawing it? Yeah, I believe it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, John, just just on the uh, doing something like the spider. Um, you know, it, it, um, you've talked a bit about the the, the pointiness of of uh, of the spider as a as a design, which kind of fit, fitted in into how Reg Bun um, portrayed him. Um, mm. Is is that something a design, a way of uh, portraying somebody that slotted nicely into the the, the way that you draw? Because I, I, you know, we, we we talked when we had on the podcast about how you know you, you've you've evolved your style and um, you know looked at the way you, you you draw things. Was it easy to uh, to absorb that character into uh, into the way you draw? Yes, no problem at all. Um, especially if you the scans that are shot from his original artwork you know today where you can actually pick out all the incredible detail that he put into his work he was called the hatching king or something wasn't he i mean he absolutely rendered the living crap out of his pages and they are fabulous and his figure work was terrific i mean he's a great storyteller so trying to all i wanted to do was emulate his style as much as possible and not do him too much of a disservice with my work. Um, I put a lot of effort into the art um, and I put a lot of sort of hatching and such like just to get that, just to, I mean, that's the way my style has gone a bit these days anyway, but it, I, I felt I just sort of pushed it a little bit extra and a little bit further with this, just to try and keep that vibe that the spider it's had. The the page of the um, uh, uh, the Steve the waves crashing of a storm and the helicopter coming in over the the, uh, the prison. Uh, I, I you've done a particularly nice job on that, John. It's Thank you very much. Job. Stuff. You're yeah. far too kind. You're far too kind. Yeah, I'll take I it. Am. <laughs> I am too kind. Yeah, but no, you you look at the original artwork as well, and like of, of the era, there's about twelve panels on every page as well. Of it's course. just incredible. It, it's just yes, crazy. Yes, yes. And I mean, all and the work beautiful looking. every panel, because of the standard of printing and paper quality back then, most of it got turned to mud and uh, really got lost, um, which is a cry and shame. He was a man out of time, really. He should have been working in uh, 20 years later or 30 years later when print quality could have kept up with this stuff. I guess that was a way with a lot of newspapers, you know, the old newspaper artists and things like that. If you look at their originals, they're so beautifully rendered. And then, of course, they're printed in bog paper and like the, some yeah. rag and uh, half, the, half the detail is lost or just blurred into a mud. So, yeah, but uh, 
Yeah, yeah. He, Reg Bum's stuff was fantastic, and I just want to try and sort of keep a bit of that vibe with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, just be true to the character, the same way Rob was trying to get him back to his roots as well. Well, I, I want to ask Rob, because you've got um, form with the, the, the IPC archive, because you did Dr. Sin, and you did something quite radical with Dr. Sin, where oh, yeah, yeah. Um, rather than... Uh, just going with the straight character. I think it was his, was it his grandson or his nephew? Or? Yeah, it's kind of like making Doctor Turn in Doctor Sin, who is Doctor Sin is this in his original form. He's an absolutely amazing, by the way, Doctor Sin, two thousand East Summer Special or something one off, which I think John Smith wrote and and um, uh, Mr. Burns, John Burns drew it. I mean, it's some of the most that, beautiful that, that, artwork. That, that was in the the action special that had the right. cannibal spider. Uh, it's well, um, that that strip. I think when I when I did when I got asked to do Doctor Sin, they sent me PDFs of that strip, and it was absolutely gorgeous work. But anyway, um, so he's kind of like a hoary old sort of um, Hammer House of Horror sort of villain, and I don't. I just kind of thought with that, there was a really fun thing to be done with Doctor Sin, where he was like a, a Stormzy type rapper. Um, instead, who he's inherited it, and then sort of a ghost of the old Doctor Sin is advising him. So you've got this streetwise uh, black kid who is but just becoming a rap star, and then he finds out he's got a supernatural uncle whispering in his ear, and he he doesn't want any of that because he's he's too busy being a being a, you know being a, a grime star or whatever. So that that I think that was just born out of the fact that Doctor Sin sounds like a rapper, basically he sounds like an MC <laughs> or something. Sort of from simple ideas to stories sometimes come, right? But um, but yeah, but that, you kind of, I guess with any of these things, if you're asked to do it, you kind of read a bit of the past stuff and you try and get a, your head around what's fun about it and try and encapsulate that in eight pages. Because very often, especially with these type of revamps, you're not given, it's not like a 10 issue maxi series or something like that. So you've got to get in and out, make your point very quickly and try and tell a fun story and bugger off, um, which is, yeah. It's on my business card. Maybe. <laughs> it, it, I, I guess the, the the question is: Is it just circumstance that that dictates whether you go for something different with a character, with a, a you know a, a, a classic character, an archive character like this, or kind of tack more closely to to how it was? Because obviously, like I said, with the Doctor Sin stuff, you went very different. Yeah, but, but with, he's he's in I it as well. Really, yeah. the, the original Doctor Sin was in that, so I felt like I was being kind of you know. If anyone out there is a big fan of Doctor Sin, I think he only appeared in about two two stories. So you good luck to you. But um, I don't think the Doctor Sin convention every year is heaving, basically. You know what I mean? But um, I kept him in it as an original character. So you know, I think you, if you're asked to do it, you want to try and stay true to what's the DNA of what's people liked about something originally you know what I mean otherwise there's no point doing it but you always want to try and come at something with a little bit of a hook which is a little different a little sort of you and you know something to make it feel a bit fresh there's no point just rolling out a cover version because I mean I've, I've, I've asked this before many times but what, what what's the worth in revisiting these characters because the this despite you know it, it, of, of his time, he's very, as you say, he's very overblown, quite verbose, very arrogant. Um, is is the the appeal uh, kind of puncturing that or or playing with it? Hmm. I think play. If it's some things like that, which are naturally kind of big and poppy, and um, then yeah, I didn't see much point in doing a Marvel man with it, and kind of. Uh, I mean, someone else could do that very interestingly don't get me wrong but where you kind of like try and dig in and look for the hidden depths um especially not on an eight pager um yeah i, I don't know you just kind of I, I don't think it's any different really if you're asked to pitch a spider-man story or a superman story or a judge dread story you try and kind of go okay what's interesting about this what 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 is in, interesting of it to, to me anyway you know and that's what you try and pull out of the story so i guess it, I don't want to sound mercenary, but you, you are a kind of writer for hire in these circumstances. You know what I mean? It's like, I guess it's different if you're coming in and going, this is my all-time passion project. You might have a different approach. 
but you just want to tell an entertaining story that's got an interesting character and you want to kind of stay true to the to the spirit of the original because there are especially with things like the spider especially there are a lot of people who have really loved that character and, and you don't want to come in and you know uh be um sort of insulting to sort of the creators that went before and, and do something that sort of diminishes their work so you want to you want to try and do the best job you can and make it fun but whether or not there's you know why do it i mean if there's fun stories to be told of any of these characters then great you know what i mean it's just you've got beautiful looking artwork from john and hopefully you've got a fun script so you've got a fun time for eight pages is is the hope you know i don't think we're going to win pulitzers is that on your business cards as well? A, a fun time in eight Indeed. pages? Oh, exactly, yes. Put that in the cover. Indeed. <laughs> oh, also, oh, yeah, we're not going to win Pulitzers. That should be on the cover as well. Sort of. Yeah, yeah. Bit of uh, John, I just, I just wanted to get a sense from you um, about the, the, the... It's quite an action-orientated script. You know, there's, there's, there's lots of explosions, lots of running around. Um, and I wanted to get a sense from you of how you found a script like this. You know, it is short. It is only eight pages. You've got a lot to pack in. Um, and I know that when I've interviewed um, other artists who, who, who are new to, say, for example, Dread or the Future Shock format, all going from a standing start to kind of full sprint is quite difficult. But, I mean, you've, you've, you've got form with with, uh, uh, with with kind of short storytelling because you know of your, sure. your career. Sure. Um, I mean, go on. I I don't mind it at all. I mean, it was great fun story. It, it at no point was I bored. Uh, Rob kept it shifting along, um, and yeah, I mean, it, it's eight pages, so you've got to have a beginning, middle, and end. So and you want a nice bit of action in the middle. Um, so yeah. Yeah, you got your you've got your big reveal, you've got your action, you've got your setup at the start. So yeah, it 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 did all that. It kept me entertained. Well done, Rob. You know, you've got a future and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, I had I I really enjoyed drawing it. Um had a bit of military hardware in there, which was always fun to do. If you don't have to draw it for a hundred pages. Eight pages is perfect. You you get in, you draw your military hardware, you get the fuck out. You don't want to mess about with that stuff for a hundred pages. I that's why I sort of every time somebody says to me, it's a war story, I'm like, no. <laughs> You're all right. No. Drawing drawing a hundred pages of war story, no thank you. Getting all that military stuff right. I've been put through the grind by Garth. Sorry. <laughs> Well, too many times to to go back to um to draw back to drawing military stuff but for eight pages fantastic it's good fun to stretch i, I did i did a, i won't i won't tell their name out of respect to them but i once uh had a curry at a convention and the the partner of of, of an artist i've been working with on a, on a on a military thing said uh -huh. he he cried over this script <laughs> <laughs> it's like because of the amount of reference that was necessary to do this script i actually saw tears and it's like oh, okay right, i feel yeah. bad now yeah yeah well you know that's um even even the, even the mighty carl suscala um mentioned about uh, what was it thank god for the internet when he was working with garth because he was like i just where would i get this stuff you know well i mean i went because i did we're talking about the smash special i did the story for the battle special you know and then i um i did the destroyer story with pj you know living monster mm. pj holden um and um i was reading through hms nightshade and you look at all that stuff you know that sort of um yeah. mike weston did you go where did they get the reference the reference on every panel is extraordinary you know the artwork's absolutely beautiful but um yeah thank god for the internet but those guys who were doing battle and you know you know warlord and things like that back in the day it's um have it's you been reading like westerns diaries no uh, uh, on the battle facebook page uh, right which is set up by a guy called paul trimble who yep. is from northern ireland i used to hang out with paul quite a bit um he set up the battle facebook page and they're 
they've got Mike Western's son, who's right. got Mike's diaries, and he's putting up pages every so often from Mike's diaries. It's really interesting reading, okay, Mike, cool. discuss, talking about the guys from IPC or whatever, ringing him up, and Mike just sort of going, oh, God, I have to talk to Tom Tully. Oh, crap, or <laughs> what have you. And uh, it's a really fascinating little look into sort of a, an artist from that time period and his work. And I'm, and I'm a big Mike Western fan. I've got a couple of pages of HMS Nightshade original artwork. Um, lovely stuff. So, yeah, yeah, it's really fascinating. I recommend sort of signing up to the battle. Um, All right, cool. And, yeah, and the... I mean, that's John Wagner as well for, for 2080 people watching this. And I know, I'm talking about, I, know, I think Garth said he thinks that IHMS Nightshade is the best thing John ever wrote. So, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's amazing stuff. Well, huge thanks to Rob and to John. There'll be more from Rob in a future episode of the Thrillcast as we dive into the Jumping On issue, which is coming up for 2000 AD Prog 2184, which is out on the uh, 3rd of June. Um, that's got all new stories starting, including a brand new Dread story by Rob and, um, well, Colin McNeil and Henry Flint. Very special. Very much looking forward to it. So um, that's going to be on a future episode. Uh, I was also uh, really pleased to be able to uh, drop a line to Abraham Reisman, who is a journalist I've known uh, from going over to uh, US conventions. Uh, he's, uh, as he'll explain, he's currently writing a book about a, a very particular comic book personality. But um, he decided he wanted to do a deep dive onto uh, Steve Yowles and Grant Morrison's Zenith. Now... As a character, if anybody, if you're familiar with 2080, you should know Zenith. If you've not read it, then uh, do make sure you pick it up. It's an absolutely fascinating, not not just because of, of uh, what it is. It's one of the rare superheroes that 2080 has ever published. But also, it's uh, so important to the beginning and subsequent development of uh, Grant Morrison's career. So uh, it was fantastic to be able to talk to Abraham and uh, do a deep dive onto Zenith. Uh, well, why don't you introduce yourself, Abraham? Hi, uh, I'm Abraham Reisman. Uh, I'm a journalist based in Brooklyn here in New York City. Uh, I, for many years, wrote for New York Magazine as a staff writer and uh, have written a bunch about comics and the comics industry. Uh, and I'm currently uh, freelance because I'm, uh, I've been writing a book that's about to come out in September uh, called True Believer, The Rise and Fall of Stan Lee. It's coming out with Penguin Random House. And I don't know if we have a UK publisher yet, but it will be available in one form or another in the UK, I'm sure. But um, anyway, yeah, that's, that's my little capsule. Okay. And um, you, 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 um, you decided that uh, when we were discussing doing this podcast, you decided you want to talk about Zenith, which uh, is Grant Morrison and Steve Yow's well, masterpiece, really. It's, it's one of those strips that um, a lot of people mention as, as being a classic of 2080. It's in the kind of second phase of 2080, where hmm. a lot of the, the major writers and artists had, had moved on uh, to Pastures Green in um, uh, American comics, and then Grant Morrison and and uh, Steve came along with uh, with Zenith. Do you, do you want to explain your, your your thinking behind choosing Zenith as as your deep dive subject? Sure. Yeah, uh, it's basically just because I've long been fascinated, uh, like many people of my generation, and you know, a couple generations or half generations ahead of me, uh, with Grant Morrison. I, I think. I don't love everything he does, but um, virtually everything he's done uh, at least has some nugget in there that's worth chewing on. And um, I read the first volume, and then in preparation for this, I read a bunch of the rest. And I I was not disappointed because there's a lot of Grant Morrison-y stuff in there. <laughs> it gets it gets pretty Morrison-ish uh, over and over again, and Steve's art is 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 terrific as well. So um, it was a real treat to be able to to keep going with it, um, uh, even though I I loved the first volume when I read it years ago. I think I got it from you. I was at San Diego Comic Con, and I think uh, I didn't really know who you were at that point, but I figured uh, I might as well pick this up. And um, anyway, that that's basically why. I picked. Okay, so one thing that I, I, I think, well, 
the most obvious thing to talk about is that this is a very British take on superheroes. In mm. fact, a, a, probably the most British. I, I, I know, you know, we can talk about the difference between this and Watchmen in a moment, but, sure, but yeah. in terms of the cultural references, the touchstones, what uh, Morrison does with this, it is incredibly British. And, and I, I wanted to see what you thought about that. For being from the side <laughs> of I thought you were going to ask me about that or it would come up at least. I love the fact that all of these 80s British cultural references are barely catching on with me or uh, are completely lost on me. It get well, because I think about this a lot whenever I read anything or watch anything that's deeply steeped in, in contemporary references. I mean, you can't help but start to wonder, like, what would it be like if I were from some other culture and had no idea what was being discussed here? Like, would this still work? And um, you hope uh, that it would uh, if you're trying to create a work like that's going to last um, and, and transcend borders. And so it's fascinating because Zenith, Zenith, I guess we'll call it Zenith. Uh, this, this is like how I make a point of saying John Constantine instead of Constantine, just so I can be a real, you know, um, prig about it. But anyway, so Zenith, what I love about it is it's so not just British, but like 80s, late 80s British. From my limited understanding of uh, the great country of the United Kingdom, um, uh, there's just a chop, like, just the idea, and we had this in the U.S. as well in the Reagan era, this Thatcher era idea of like the guy who was the big 60s hippie and then becomes this complete conservative jerkwad. You know, that is so on point with so much, so much of the 80s. Um, and I, But all the like specific cultural references, most of it like occasionally I would get one and the right and what's, what's funny about that is it makes it an interesting reading experience vis-a-vis -vis the title character because that's kind of his whole personality like I'm sure if you're coming at it as a British person who's well versed in what the world was like in the late 80s you can read his references and go like oh what a charming man whereas for me he's actually the least interesting character in the book because so much of what he does is based on like being himself part of that zeitgeist and also referencing the zeitgeist and i just don't it doesn't track for me so i had this really interesting reading experience of just sort of being kind of unimpressed with him but everybody else was vivid and and timeless it's interesting uh, looking at it from a 21st century perspective because so much of the 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 uh, rhetoric over the last sort of five ten years has been um that classic thing of people lambasting the young for being vain, lazy, hollow, <laughs> yeah. you know, you, you know nothing kind, kind of thing, which, which as, as a history of fiction idol I know goes all the way back to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right. That's every not good, every yeah. generation has a go at the, 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 the new generation. Yeah. Um, so it, it's... He, it, to a certain extent, Zenith is timeless. He is that slightly vacuous... Slightly, yes. very vacuous, um, <laughs> self-interested. Exactly. So, uh, to a certain extent, he—I think he's actually the character that has aged the least out of all of these. Oh, interesting. I can see that. I mean, I don't think it's so much that he's aged. It's more just um, there's a lot of him that just requires a literacy that I don't have in order to fully get. It's not just. I can tell what you're trying, what the, what Grant is, is tell I call him Grant because we're friends, so I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, what, what Morrison's trying to tell us is um, that this guy is this very like plugged in uh, ephemeral um, guy who just loves showing how clever he is by referencing things. So like I pick up on that. So I get what the characterization is trying to do, but I'm sure there's nuance beyond there of like, the kinds of references he chooses to make, the connotations that those references have. And what's fascinating is like, that's lost on me. So I, I always consider that sort of thing when I'm encountering it with my own time, milieu, whatever. I always think like, that's a nice bonus. Like that should always be how it is. That, the, that if you are from that milieu, you get like the, the extra soupçon of delight of knowing the very specific nuances of these references. And every, you know, if you've done your work right, then the rest of it will will function and you can have a full experience of reading it without needing that. And I feel like Zenith does that. 
yeah, it, it's 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 that thing of does it get in the way at any point for your preparation? Um, I the all the references. I don't think they really get in the way. It's more just occasionally there'll be a a, a panel where I go, oh, something's trying to land here, and it it's not coming through because I, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, but uh, it doesn't get in the way. I mean, it, all of these things are like, the idea of them is that even the references are ephemeral. Like it's still just getting tossed off. Like it, it, none of it takes up too much time. Although I don't know, maybe there was some subtle reference stretching throughout the entire work that I completely missed. But um, uh, no, I didn't think it got in the way. I, I, I didn't feel stumbling on it. I didn't just thinking about this this uh um perception as uh well not perception the reality of of zenith as being um a kind of millennial type so you know self-obsessed shallow etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. and but then um one of the interesting things i think uh morrison does is he layers so many different kind of generations um into the story so yes there are some points where it almost feels like it, it, it's meant to be a generational conflict because you've got nazis so you've got the the, the war generation you've yeah, got hippies sure. and then you've got the 80s coming along and it, it's 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 so interesting to see how he deals with those differently sure and you know that's a parallel you can then draw that was something that from my understanding you know i was two in 1987 but um you know, from my understanding, which is derived largely from reading too many comic books and books about comic books, you know, that was something that for comics reading kids of the 80s, especially the mid to late 80s, was very pressing for them because you have sort of the beginning of, um, you know, th this flourishing of their generation, right? Like in the early 80s, you start to get stuff like, you know, Miracle Man or, you know, other early Moore works. And um, you know, any, a wide array of, of people who would, would be at Stetson AD and elsewhere. Um, and then by the late eighties, these are the people who are getting real cracks at the big leagues and are really allowed to kind of run free and do interesting stuff. And what does everybody do when they're given the chance to, um, to, you know, write or whatever they want, they write about themselves, right? Like once you are given that full freedom and you have that confidence, what are you going to do but investigate something going on inside your head? Now, these works are not, sorry, when I say these works, I'm thinking um, especially Zenith and Watchmen are works that are very much about comic book history and about generational torch passing uh, when it comes to comic books. And, I mean, obviously, and generational torch passing from 40s, 60s, 80s in general, but very specifically, works like Watchmen and, and Dark Knight Returns in its own way. You know, a lot of these are backward looking works that are trying to say, okay, what I went, you know, I suffered through my childhood and came out the weirdo that I am. Who do I blame for that? <laughs> and you kind of end up looking backwards to your parents and their parents and kind of tracing the lineage of how everything ended up so terrible at the end of the 1980s not that today is a whole lot better but you know at the end of the 80s i would imagine for everybody it was a grim until the wall comes down there's a lot of like are we just going to get nuked and get it over with you know um so anyway that that was something that i was thinking about per your point well in in that respect it, it's uh interesting to think about zenith as satire and mm. the obvious satire of of superheroes the 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 less uh, obvious satire of as you say generational torch passing and then general satire of of the times you know taking the piss out of thatcher and and yeah. uh, all, all the other uh, references like that um i'm i'm wondering does the for you does the satire still work is it still a satire that's worth exploring and 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 reading yeah, well Absolutely, because, I mean, look, the comic book industry, the superhero industry, which are not the same thing, but have a big overlap. I mean, that's powerful stuff that deserves, right now, uh, more exploration than it's ever deserved, because this has become this hegemonic genre, and comics have become this, you know, cog in a giant, you know, dream-making beast 
Um, and these are, these are real concerns, these, these thematic investigations of like, why do we keep coming back to this stuff? What does it say about us? How can we make it better, make the material better? How can we make ourselves better? All of that. It's still really relevant to look at the superheroes of the 40s, the 60s, the 80s, um, and try to pick apart um, how you know, previous generations approached these ideas and this medium and figure out kind of, okay, if we're going to, through satire, through, or it's not always satire, satire. Oftentimes it's just sort of, okay, well, here's my riff on what this, you know, famous actual character was like. When you start doing that at length, it allows you to kind of, um, collect your own thoughts, uh, sorry, when you're reading that, I should say, collect your own thoughts and then project them onto your own generation or, you know, the generation in the middle here, which, uh, you know, you know, the aughts, uh, which I guess is when I was reading comics. And if I had been making comics, I probably would have been um, making them about looking back at the superheroes of the 80s as like the influence that, uh, or whatever. I'm, I'm getting convoluted on the time, but to answer your question, um, I think the satire still works. Also because like ephemeral pop idiots are still, you know, uh, a thing that doesn't go away. So, you know, I guess there's a, you know, I hadn't thought about this, but I guess Jupiter's legacy owes a lot to this as well. Like uh, this idea of sort of louche superhero who kind of, um, you know, uh, turns his back on responsibility. And of course, Morrison and Miller, that's a whole relationship. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting off track, but um, yeah, no, I think the satire still works. I, I, the, 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 the whole kind of um, uh, Miller, Morrison, Moore thing is something that we'll come on to talk about uh, in, 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 in a bit. Let, let's, let's get uh, back down to the, to, to, to the strip itself. I, mm -hmm. I just say you'd, you'd, read, you'd read book one, which um, uh, is great. Uh, book two, uh, very similar. Then when you start getting into three and four, there's, there's quite a significant tone change. Yeah. Right? And three, I mean, three, right. Three is a thrill. I mean, I was not expecting it to get quite that grandiose, although I should have given that it's Grant Morrison, but like, I, I just, for some reason, well, not for some reason, the first two books, although there's like cosmic dangers, it, it, it's not really like parallel worlds, cosmic dangers. Like, you know, one thing I thought while reading phase three was, um, you know, God, I, I have no idea what his reading habits are because he's a very private man, but I would be shocked if Jonathan Hickman hadn't read this and like had some thoughts about it that he then plugged into uh, Secret War, um, Secret Wars rather, uh, because, you know, it's that scale. Uh, you know, it's funny, on the, the back cover, I only noticed this at the very end, the back cover of phase three, you guys put in... Um, was it a crisis, a secret war? And then there's the description of the book. I'm like, okay, I get it. Good job. You, you identified your, your place in history. But, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it gets really big. And I loved that. I'm a total sucker for stuff where the entire cosmos is collapsing in on itself. I've been apocalypse fixated since I was in like third grade. And I first heard about the heat death of the universe, you know, and like, I, I love that kind of fiction. Of course, now that we're actually sort of living it, it's, it's a different experience, but I, I love reading when Morrison goes uh, to that zoomed out, you know, uh, view of the entire multiversal chain and the threats that are attendant upon it. And, um, so yeah, once you kick into that high gear, you realize like, oh, this is really a training ground for a lot of the stuff. Not, it's not just a training ground, it's a great work in and of itself, but like this is a, a place where he was just first starting to tap into some of the bigger ideas that would permeate a lot of his other work, especially the invisibles. You know, I mean, obviously, you know, Steve Yowell being part of that as well. Um, this is very much a like proving ground uh, for a lot of the stuff that they're gonna do later. Um, but yeah, I, I loved that transition. It felt like a pretty natural transition. There'd been enough seeding in phases one and two that it wasn't like a complete lurch to the left. It, it's it's just a sort of interesting upping of the ante. It's it's always fascinating to to hear people's reaction to Zenith and and to see whether they are a, a phase one and two. 
person mm. or a face to and for person because it tells you an awful lot about their reading habits and and what and what they like and uh, one of the things that uh amongst the people i know that who, who, who prefer uh, fa- the, the, the early phases yeah is because it is exactly as you say it, it is it is kind of a, a, a zoomed in uh very small stage so you you get a better sense i think of of zenith's personality in that um sure. whereas as as the the focus starts to pull backwards uh, well, pull out you you see a lot more of the machinations of the other characters so mm-hmm. injun and and and, uh, and and people like that and it's um the the Further it goes along, I feel, and I'd be interested to get your perspective, mm-hmm. the more Zenith actually plays uh, less and less of a part in his own... Oh, death. 100%. I mean, that was uh, kind of what I was getting at when, um, when I was talking about how some of the references were a little lost on me and therefore the character isn't quite as rich for me as it might be for others. One of the reasons that's the case is I think even, I, I don't know his intentions, but I would imagine Morrison did intentionally kind of had planned out that you're going to start with Zenith as a POV character. And then that's, that's the hook, right? Like, cause who in 1987 was doing stories about superheroes that are just like gross pop idols who uh, drink and screw all day. I mean, that was not as common as it would later become. Um, so you have that as like a hook to draw people in and then it can be this sort of Trojan horse for this story about, you know, chaos and order and, you know, the collapse of everything. Because, yeah, by the time you get to something like Phase 3, Zenith is still there and he's interesting, but, like, you know, the most interesting thing about him in Phase 3 is all the mix-ups with Vertex and Zenith. You know, like, that's, that's like, because there you're actually getting interesting commentary on him and you're adding a, a new character and it just becomes more panoramic and that worked for me. I will say... It was hard for me at times to totally follow who everybody was. Um, one thing that whenever I read 2000 AD stuff, which I love, one thing that I always have to adjust to is black and white. My, my comics reading eye has, hard, has a harder time identifying and remembering who characters are visually without color. I have no idea why, but like anytime I read a 2000 AD, I find myself having to flip backward and go like, okay, wait, who am I looking at right here? I, I know I'm supposed to be picking up this cue, but for some reason, the stark monochrome just uh, messes with me. But yeah, the cast gets bigger, and I found that fascinating. Sorry, I was just taking a note and uh, <laughs> going for a space yeah. bar. Um, and come back to what you were saying earlier about um, uh, the satire of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me... Um, one of the interesting things that that Morrison does is, um, I think, compares the music industry mm. to the comic book industry to the the notion of these big organisations that that that, yeah. are, that, that that are manipulating uh, individuals to a certain extent. Um, but of course, Morrison has then gone to work in that industry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and and it's, I mean, it's, I'm not accusing anybody of hypocrisy in any way, shape or form. No, no, of course not. But um, it, it's, it's fascinating that uh, where, whereas you get something like Zenith, where particularly with phase three, I mean, that is mocking every crossover ever, you know, as you say, you know, it's sure. just, it's taking the piss out of Secret Wars and, uh, and all this, that and the other. And it's, it's, it, it, uh, Morrison goes through the pantheon of uh, right. classic British char- comic book characters and, and offs them one after the other. Um, but the, to then make one's living either doing that or riffing off of that is, is, is absolutely fascinating. You know, this is the man who, who, who did yeah. an acclaimed X-Men run, you know? You're, well, you're, you're telling the story of like in many ways not the only story but a sub story of 2000 ad right like you get morrison is not the only person who started out doing vicious satire of american and british comics and then ended up like actually in the driver's seat doing a lot of this stuff and no it's not hypocrisy because i mean that look x-men um you know the jla run the batman run i mean 
the stuff that uh, even like his action comics run, which nobody talks about, but I liked a lot. Grant ended up doing a lot of interesting subversive stuff with superheroes. So I don't see it as a contradiction at all. It's more just, you know, not, th those works aren't as openly satirical, but um, individual characters are, individual storylines are. And uh, that's something that he never really let go of. You know, if he'd gone like fully earnest and had just lost that sort of, um, you know, uh, the, the bleeding edge of, uh, of, of being, you know, incisive like that, if he'd lost that, then it would be hypocritical. Then you'd be like, ah, oh, come on. How did you, how did you sell out like that? But no, he, I mean, unless you want to get into the politics of selling out period, you know, of like going to the big leagues, which is a, a completely different conversation. Um, I think thematically he, he, it's, it's a straight through line. In fact, when you look at something like phase three, it's sort of like, you know, his JLA fight uh, trapped in the world of his invisibles, you know, like he's really coming up with a lot. How old was he in 87? Very young. I, he was in his twenties. I think. Yeah. He's in his twenties at that point. So, I mean, the impetuousness of youth. I mean, he, he's got all of these ideas. And of course, because it's 2000 AD, this is the other thing I love about reading 2000 AD, the chapters are short. So you like have to actually be economical in the way you tell a story, which American comic creators have often forgotten. Um, so there's a lot packed in there, including, yeah, like he's playing with superheroes, he's playing with Cthulhu and Lovecraft. You know, he's trying to cram all this in one space. And later in his career, a lot of it would be him sort of picking out elements of what's in Zenith and expanding them. But it's it's all still there. I think it's a through line. Yeah, it, uh, someone I knew many years ago always said that with Zenith, you, you can essentially see the, the DNA of everything that Morrison did subsequently. I don't know about everything, but a lot. Certainly a lot. I mean... It's, it's, it's his take on superheroes. It's his take on free will and order and chaos. It's his, you know, paradimensional invaders thing, which he, he can't get enough of. Um, it's riffing on, um, you know, different, uh, on sort of subverting the superhero past as well as trying to create a new present and future. Um, you know, there's, oh, and one thing that we haven't talked about much is there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of really terrifying stuff in this. Like I was, I was a little taken. Up. There are times when it's never an unnatural shift from satire to terror. Um, he's good at pacing that way, but you will have these moments where you go like, wait, is this the same comic as the one that I started out reading when I began with this? Like, this is, uh, this is getting pretty like, I mean, I guess at the very beginning, it's pretty with the A-bomb, it's pretty intense, but like, then you go into the Zenith thing and for a while it's kind of fun. And then eventually you end up in this place where you have like, you know, when they're visiting alternative 666 and just like keep finding all these like awful horrors that have happened to other people. I mean, the obvious comparison point, of course, is in, in Miracle Man, Marvel Man, Miracle Man, um, where you have the sort of Grand Guignol, however you pronounce that, uh, horrors in there as well. And, um, you know, seeing it here, I was really taken aback because you have certain lines. I, I took some screenshots, but now I, I don't have them in front of me where you just, in just a few sentences, he can just chill the hell out of you. And, um, you know, it's, it's stuff that Moore was playing with. It's stuff that he played with that Miller would later play with. Um, you know, when comics can really cut past your defenses and in just a brief few words or a single static image, just imprint on your brain some vision of horror that you never forget. It's, it's, it's unlike any other kind of reading experience in my, in my view. And there's a lot of moments like that in Zenith, I, I thought. I, absolutely. The one that really um, I remember more than any of the others is, uh, and this plays into um, Yoel's uh, strength as an artist, is The Black Sun. Yes, yes. The notion of the, the sun essentially is an incubator. Um, <laughs> and just, just that single stark image. Like I said, yeah. it, play, it plays into your old strengths. But, it, I mean, that's terrifying. You know, the, 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 yes. the, one, the one constant, uh, in our, you know, the sun always shines, blah, blah, blah. Right, right, right. right. And, and it, it, it subverts it. And, and you're right, it, it, that, it's a really scary moment. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, and you, you have to have a good understanding of, of 
human empathy to understand how to um, to really mess with people that way. You know, it's sort of like I've for there's a project I'm working on that has to do with professional wrestling. So I've been a lot watching a lot of wrestling, and the best heels were you know the the bad guys in wrestling have always historically been the ones who are able to really poke at things that you think are sacred and just go like, you think, how dare you, sir? You know, you get actually angry more so than if like the storyline is like the good guy's dog was stolen by the bad guy and now they have to revenge, uh, you know, find vengeance against each other. Um, It's much more terrifying or, or goading if there's something you think is sacred that's like not supposed to be commented upon even, and then you comment on it, you conjure up an image and it just chills you because you go, well, that's not supposed to happen. That's, that's completely alien to the laws of good decency. And there are a lot of moments like that that Morrison has in Zenith where you are, um, you just think like, oh, you can't do that to a child superhero. Like that's, that's horrifying. Like, how dare you? But I guess that's how 2000 AD has gotten by for, you know, you have the book in front, behind you, Thrill Power Overload. <laughs> You've, you guys figured out how to like, uh, to needle the reader into having a very emotional response to something quite, uh, quite horrid at times. And um, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's a talent that he has and, and that Yowl has. Uh, there's, there's really good stuff in there. It. For me, it's it's really interesting to think of um, Zenith in the kind of uh, spectrum of obviously Watchmen, Miracle Man slash Marvel uh, Man, yeah. Marvel Man, um, but also uh, on, on the spectrum of things like American Flag. Yes, yes, all the way through to Martial Law. Yeah, and the different way that different writers tackle the same thing, which is to try and either deconstruct or to destroy the notion of the superhero <laughs> and, and um, you know, with, with Morrison, I, th- I think he, he has a, a very clear and intimate understanding of superheroes because he doesn't necessarily, he deconstructs not to destroy. No, no. He deconstructs to rebuild, uh, to put things mm-hmm. back together. And you, you know, you, you look at the stuff he was doing with super gods and, and uh, uh, with his Superman run mm. and, Whereas Pat Mills and Alan Moore were were trying to call time on superheroes, mm-hmm. so it had to be quite extreme in what they did. Morrison was very, uh, for me, was very much breaking it down to rebuild it in his own image. No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, you look at, um, you know, it took Alan Moore a long time to fully walk away from superheroes and who knows if he'll ever truly do that or, you know, if he'll keep coming back. Um, but, you know, Watchmen was very much him sort of, uh, by all accounts, kind of trying to close the book or at least participate in kind of a wrapping up of at least superhero as we knew it. Um, you know, I mean, for Christ's sakes, the, the great famed lost um, storyline he had for DC was Twilight of the Superheroes, like this idea of kind of the sun setting and therefore it's time to like, you know, dissect it and, and try and figure out and like, maybe write a eulogy for it. Um, but that it was, a lot of those stories are really kiss offs. Um, whereas you're exactly right with Grant, there's the sort of childish enthusiasm of going like, wow, I can, you know, break apart my Legos and then put them back together again in a different shape and make a completely new toy. And that's something that he really went on to do, you know, to varying degrees of effectiveness. It, it doesn't always work. He's very prolific. So some of it is good. Some of it has, has flaws in it. But like, he really did then set about, um, as you put it, deconstructing to rebuild. And, um, you know, some of those stories are, are among my favorites in the history of superhero comics, uh, the stuff that he went on to do later. And um, you can see a lot of those, those seeds being planted here. Absolutely. It's, it's him, him playing around and breaking the stuff so he can rebuild it. Because ultimately, um, Grant Morrison is a, is a, is a postmodernist. He's a, he's a child of the age. Of, 100%, yeah. You know, a, a, um, uh, the end of history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So it, it, 
it's fascinating, and we are <laughs> we are now going to talk about. Morrison and Moore because great uh, I am so ready for this I don't know why you're saying that trepidatiously I've been waiting for the opportunity but yes go ahead oh but it's interesting to, 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 to see um, their different takes and the ensuing history mm-hmm. uh, between them there's a kind of uh, more dealt with superheroes in a way of they were sweet they were great you know, they're inspiring, blah, 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 blah. But we are moving out of a medieval belief into rationalism now. Yes, exactly. Yes. Morrison then comes along and goes, well, that's, that's great to be in rational territory, but actually belief and faith and ideas are yeah. now more important than ever. And so you, you have him moving into the post one. And, and for me, that is one of the aspects that was always going to cause conflict between their two views of superhero. Yeah. Yes. Because for, for, for more, uh, uh, although he's a great believer in magic and all this, that and the other, his take on superheroes is fundamentally a rationalist one. Whereas mm-hmm. uh, for, Mor- for Morrison, superheroes are a toy box with lots of ideas and themes and, and beliefs and faiths that you can play with. Yes, but also, I mean, to get at the post- postmodern part of it, he also has a love of an unabashed love of spectacle that um, I think more often, look, Alan Moore does spectacle great, but he's very restrained. In, he doesn't do it all that often. Like, um, you know, there'll be these moments that stick in your mind of like a, an action sequence uh, or some gigantic explosion or a, a big dramatic line. But for the most part, um, he's sparing with that. Whereas Morrison, you know, I always think of what he, his whole thesis about his Batman run, which was, every Batman story happened. You know, we're not gonna, there's not gonna be anything that's out of canon. Like, weird Dick Sprang 50s Batman, you got it. All of that stuff happened with the same guy who also did Batman year one. You know, that Batman is is present, you know, whatever. Um, As you say, it's a toy box. And I think what he loves to do, uh, more than more likes to do it, um, is uh, show us something big, flashy, colorful, weird, brash, funny um he he's it's not that he lacks uh restraint where it's necessary but he he does do a lot of throwing stuff at the wall and then seeing um what what you know becomes a sigil uh, <laughs> and um you know it's it's fun to watch it's fun to read through especially his stuff from the late 80s early 90s you know zenith being a great example of it um, you see that love of spectacle, and that's something you don't see so much in, or see as much in more. But yeah, there's the there's the faith aspect too, where like, I think for both of them, they're both very passionate about magic in one form or another. But um, it clearly means different things to them. Um, you know, I'm not as well schooled on Moore's approach to magic as I should. A lot of it is kind of you know, um, stuff that's probably, you know, if I ever met the guy, I'd, I'd, I'd ask him for lowdown, but I mostly just, you know, read things and, you know, read his comics that deal with it. But for him, magic always seems more about like, um, you know, the archeology span of the past and like trying to sort of exhume things, analyze them, evaluate them, and then say, okay, now we have our permission to, to sort of um, put away childish toys. Whereas um, Morrison loves the childish toys. He can't get enough of them. He doesn't want them to go away. He wants them to live for a thousand years. And uh, I find that, that tension between the two of them to be uh, fascinating because they both play it out, especially Morrison in terms of commenting on each other's work within the work. And, you know, you have stuff like, you know, as you're saying, you have that perfect example of Pax Americana, the DC comic that he did, where he's just ripping on Watchmen and the whole thesis is like, Watchmen is boring (laughs) because it's, because it's too clockwork. Like everything has to have a meaning, everything fits together. And that's dull to me, Grant Morrison. So I'm going to write a whole acclaimed story with Frank Quitely in which I talk about how dull it is. And if only we all, every critic in the world who writes about comics envy, envies the, the creators who get to just write their essays in the form of comics that get sold to thousands. Um, so anyway, no, that's a great point. Yeah, I think you're completely right. There's something also that um, uh, Morrison does with Zenith, which I, I, 
I, I think uh, contrasts with the way that uh, Moore treats superheroes. And it's very specifically that uh, Morrison charts their uh, history backwards to the Nazis. Yes. And to the concept of the of the, the, the human race, you know, the 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 the, the, the superman. Yes. About how uh, at, at, at its at its heart there is an uncomfortable truth about superheroes, which is sure. that um, they appeal to uh, that desire for strength. Mm -hmm. in all, which was you know uh, one of the one of the foundations of the of the Nazi ideology that, that you can sure. be strong, you you know you can overcome your enemies by applying sure. force. Um, whereas uh, with more, I think, you know, you, 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 uh, yes, Watchmen deconstruction and isn't particularly uh, pleasant towards superheroes, but also you get something like uh, um, uh, The Man Who Has Everything. Yeah. Which is a 100% love letter to childhood, to sure. the, the comics he, he grew up in. So it's, it's interesting that, that, that from the very beginning of Morrison's time writing superheroes at 2000 AD with Zenith, like from the from the first episode he's like nazis <laughs> <laughs> it's true well i mean look the nazis are the um the the er super villain within superhero fiction right i mean super superhero fiction essentially gets invented to beat up nazis um and that's we've we've never found villains more uh, potent than them everything else kind of is a branch off from that. I mean, uh, the, the, the way, you know, Nazis were depicted, be they like, I mean, there's a wide variety of Nazis as well in the history of comic books and the early history of comic books, but those archetypes of like, you know, the cackling, um, you know, aristocratic Nazi who walks around with a monocle and talks about his diabolical schemes for world domination, the like, power mad hate bigot Nazi and like, you know, the grunt Nazi who you can just off cause nobody cares. Um, you know, all that stuff was sort of baked in early. And I think it's smart for, uh, when comics openly engage with that. I mean, it's really interesting the degree to which, um, superhero comics, uh, has gradually with time become more reluctant to like use the swastika or to talk about Nazis. You'll have lots of stand-ins for the Nazis. You know, I mean, that was the whole controversy about Secret Empire with Hydra, where it's like, well, these guys are Nazis, right? Like, wasn't that the whole idea? And, but Marvel's like, no, 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 we, we don't talk about such things. That doesn't matter uh, anymore. That's, that's the distant past. Don't, don't um, forget that they are very fine people. They are very fine people in Hydra, absolutely. <laughs> um, so the point was, you know, I really applaud comics that actually take the time to try and ask, like, well, why do we keep coming back to either Nazis or Nazi archetype stand-ins? Um, what does that say about us? And what does it say about the nature of the heroes that we care about? You know, and it happens so rarely. Like, I think back to, like, the Golden Age, the, not the time, but, you know, the James Robinson and Paul Smith story uh, from DC. Like, that was one where, like, Hitler, was, a reborn Hitler was the bad guy. And it was, there was no ambiguity about who he was. And everything that happened in World War II happened, and it was being directly addressed. And it's hard to look at that stuff. Um, and I, not just because it's traumatic, but also because you have to start dealing with like, okay, well, if you're characterizing a Nazi, how do you make the Nazi uh, interesting? Well, it has to have some element of humanity and then you're humanizing a Nazi. And like, there's too many questions around it. So a lot of people just sort of avoid it. But I, I, I mean, I'm not a huge, as a Jew, I'm not a huge fan of sort of going like, oh, well, Nazis were just extra dimensional aliens. Like they, they weren't just ordinary people who happened to be horrific anti-Semites and bigots in other ways. Um, but I'll let it slide this time uh, because it, 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 I think it was an interesting take on the fact that like we've never really escaped the Nazis as being the core villains for us, uh, uh, you know, us being the, the comic book superhero community. I remember there's a line in um, uh, Tom Strong, which I, I think was one of the mm. more issues um, where Tom Strong, who, who is uh, immortal, as as, as right. a character, you know, uh, is is asked, 
what was so great about the Second World War? And, and he replies, um, it was the last good war. Right. Which, for me, neatly sums up. It, it wasn't. It was. <laughs> no, it wasn't, of course. Terrible. No, but, but um, like. But, but, but it, it neatly sums up that perception of it, that there were goodies mm-hmm. and there were baddies. And uh, certainly in the popular consciousness, if not in reality, um, the goodies acted good and defeated the baddies because of their inherent goodness. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's what you come back to with superhero fiction. You have to find these Manichaean, good, evil, light, dark um, conflicts. And um, in order to keep the genre going, even if you're subverting them, you still have to have the archetype there in some way. And um, you, you make this interesting point, which is um, we think of it as the good war and we keep coming back to it but we won't accept that like a it could have very easily gone another way and we would be the ones you know the the you know the allies would be branded as um you know conventionalism as horrible people um but also like you don't have to then engage with any of the thorny questions about who deserves to live and who deserves to die You know, one thing that one of the reasons why I fell in love with Grant Morrison as a teenager was reading uh, in in The Invisibles that that issue where he tells the entire life story of the goon who just gets shot by King. Like King Mob shoots a guy, and then I don't think it's the next issue, but a few issues later, we have this entire issue just dedicated to the interesting, intricate, nuanced life an inner world of this rando security guard who gets shot in the head by the hero of the story or one of the heroes of the story. And I've never forgotten that. I mean, I remember reading that as a teenager and it's something that pops into my head basically any time I see um, uh, a piece of fiction where some ostensibly good guy is just mowing down um, grunts, you know, mowing down all the henchmen. I go like, well, what was, you know, what was that guy's hope and dream? How did he end up being so benighted or, or coerced as to end up like this? And, um, you know, that's something that is hard to deal with when you tell stories about Nazis and at their best, they're ones that even if they don't have a conclusive answer about how you account for how humans can become like that, they at least engage with it and remind you that they were humans. And again, like I said, that's something that's a little bit of a quibble for me with Zenith because the the Nazis are all just sort of like, you know, they're part of something bigger than humanity. But it's still interesting to see them represented at all. One of the things that uh, really stuck out for me from from the reread for for this was, um, coming back to what we were talking about with satire, is the, the parody of Richard Branson. Yes, that runs yeah. all the way through uh, phase two, and uh, how uh, <laughs> Morrison was a bit ahead of his time uh, with, with with that one because it turns out the man is a, a you know a super a, a, a evil genius. Well, yeah, something villain with yeah. his own private island, etc. Et yeah, yeah, where he's run off to. Yeah, right. But um, yeah, no, I loved that. I uh, it took me a minute to sort of pick up on it. I think it would have been in in eighty eight, like something that you could immediately identify. Uh, but I, I picked up that it was Branson when he identified himself by holding up his credit card, which is just a great little detail. <laughs> I, it was like the American Express gold card or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, that was, I mean, look, it was the 80s. Anybody who was smart was doing a, a an incisive attack on consumerism and go-go glamour and cocaine and uh, rich assholes. And um, it, it works. It, I like the idea that he's just sort of doing this in some ways just because he's kind of bored, you know? It's like, well, why, what else does he have going on? Um, and then gives up on it so easily, this this plan to destroy everything. But um, anyway, yeah, no, that was clever. It, with, let, let's, let's just bring it back down to, to, to Zenith himself because mm-hmm. um, one thing I, I like about the series, <laughs> and I've already alluded to it slightly, is how out of control he is. Like yes. He is not in control of the situation. He's constantly panicking, uh, feeling as if uh, he doesn't have a handle on what's going on. You know, he, he, even his, um, uh, his fight at the end of, of the, the first phase, um, mm-hmm. really it's only stress that causes him to, to use his powers appropriately and to, and to you know, really go for it. And it, uh, um, 
it was nicely echoed by something that Morrison said about when he was uh, uh, writing Phase Four, where he said, you know, I, 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 he likes a lot of the things that he wrote when he was under duress. Yeah, uh, he, he didn't particularly want to write uh, Phase Four, but he had to. So you know, it, it kind of uh, came from. Yeah, um, uh, I want to get your take on on that, and also in the context of of Miracle Man. Slash yeah. Marvel Man. Marvel Man. I know. I never know what to call it, but yeah. <laughs> because that is a series, again, where the protagonist is very much out of control of his own destiny. It's about learning mm -hmm. um, how to take the, how to roll with the punches and, and um, try and gain some sense of control over one's life. But uh, it feels very different to the way that Zenith does it. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point. I have to think about that a little bit. And I'll think about it by talking about it. So forgive me if I ramble. But um, you know, I can say certainly as a writer, not of fiction, but like very often under duress is the absolute best way to write. Um, I mean, not only does it force you to stop procrastinating, but, um, <clears throat> you know, I grew up doing improv as a like kid. I would do, I loved being in improvisational comedy classes for some reason. Um, but one thing you learn there is like, when you don't have time to think, you often have your best ideas you you just immediately have to generate something and um, you don't overthink it. So very often you'll get something that would never occur to you if you sat down and had a good thinky thought about it. Um, and uh, you're, you're right that both of those characters, Zenith and um, Mar let, let's just say Marvel Man, because this is a UK uh, thing, so I can get away with it. Um, but uh, in both of those, you have these characters that are placed in these very tense situations and sort of rise to the occasion. You have that with other characters in Zenith as well. You know, the other superhumans from the 60s, you know, they sort of manifest their powers again by, you know, in one case, being thrown out a window. And maybe that's something that has to do with... Um, the struggle of being a writer, not just the fact that you're under duress, but like that's a mental state you know very well. Um, because it's not, you're not, very few people can be Neil Gaiman and actually make money at this stuff, you know, and like have multiple houses. Uh, being a, especially if you're more while well, he's writing Marvel Man and um, uh, Morrison while well, he's writing Zenith, there are guys in their 20s who are just scraping by trying to make it in this fly-by-night industry. Um, and in both cases, initially trying to make it in the UK where it's an even smaller industry and where everybody knows everybody. And if you slip up, you know, everyone will be uh, aware of it. Um, and maybe that was just a mental state they were both very familiar with and were able to channel into these protagonists because it's a very astute point. That is, both, both stories are very taut. And also, like I said, there's the, the um, just the physical limitation of how long 2000 AD chapters are, or just British comics chapters in general. Um, you know, it, the sequences are, are much more compact, which is always going to give some degree of tension because you have to have more cliffhangers per square, mi uh, square mile, you know? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's interesting how much Zenith is, uh, uh, the impact of Zenith is a product of its structure. And mm. the, the fact of, as you say, how it is published, whereas um, something like Watchmen, something like uh, 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 Miracle Man, it, that has a little bit more room to breathe. So I, yeah. I can I can kind of see Morrison's point about uh, the the clockwork of of, uh, of of Watchmen because there's there's uh, uh, yeah it's yeah totally um, thinking about what you said regarding black and white artwork. Now, we always have a hard sell in America because mm -hmm. so much of our back catalog is um, black and white artwork. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't go full color until the 90s. Yeah. Now, bearing that in mind, what would you say to somebody to convince them to still pick up uh, Zenith, you know, oh, even, even if they, I, they had a resistance. That's an easy on. sell. I'll just, you just tell somebody the basic um, sort of out, I mean, you don't want to spoil her too much, but like, I think getting people over the black and white is not that hard. I mean, the only people for whom it's going to be a real problem are people who have trouble reading comics anyway, which 
it's always fascinating to me to be reminded that a lot of perfectly brilliant people just they uh, they never learned how to read comics and it's a different reading skill will eisner wrote about that at length um and other you know uh, academics uh, who examined it have talked about that but like at a relatively young age if you're reading comics you learn how to read comics and it happens pretty organically you don't like take a class in comics but you're in this more pliable state and um you know, whether it's through help or just your own intuition, you figure it out. And then by the time you get older, if you haven't learned it, very often people will look at something and just go, I don't know what order to put my eye in. Do I go up and down? Do I go blah, blah, blah? Um, and I think convincing somebody to read it in black and white is not, that's not the hardest hurdle. Um, you know, I, I feel like Zenith, the only real hurdle is the pop culture references. Everything else goes down real smooth. You know, I, 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 the black and white is only an issue in that, um, for whatever reason, visual cues sometimes when it comes to identifying characters get a little lost on me. But it, everybody gets named at one point or another. And it probably also had to do with the fact that I was reading somewhat quickly for some of them. So there may have just been characters that I wasn't paying close enough attention to to remember their names or whatever. But I don't think the black and white, I know you guys have a hard sell, but I don't think it's as much of an impediment as, uh, then again, what do I know? But I don't think it's as much of an impediment as you might fear. And just to just to round off, I mean, we, we've kind of already touched on this uh, a little bit. Um, what do you think Zenith says about Morrison as a writer? And mm. was it obvious from this what trajectory he was going to be on? Mm. I think... Um, I don't know about obvious, it's hard to predict the future, but retroactively looking for those threads, you don't have to look too far. I mean, there are so many elements that would later um, crop up in his work and in the works of his admirers and, and collaborators slash admirers. Um, and, you know, when, when we talked about a lot of it already, the paradimensional stuff, uh, and it's, you know, attendant grandiosity, um, the satire, uh, the satire specifically of sort of vacuous celebrity, which is something he's always had a problem with, although he's, he learned how to like have some degree of respect for it. I think as time went on as of Zenith, it, it's pretty excoriating. It's like, screw those, uh, those bastards. Maybe the more celebrities he met, he had a softer vision of them, but like over time you get like the, you know, the um okay what's the super young team the japanese celebrities that pop up in final crisis you know by then he's like okay these people can be fun but he does tell a lot of stories that involve vacuous celebrities and you see that popping up obviously in zenith i don't know that you could have necessarily predicted his exact trajectory but i think you could definitely tell this is a guy who really really wants a shot to tell weird superhero stories like I can only imagine in 87 reading this, you know, while Watchmen is wrapping up and going like, you know, the, in many ways, it's like you're saying, there's sort of a, a twilight and new dawn happening at once. Um, you know, these two stories that have so much in common and yet at the end of the day, one is a funeral and the other is this delirious uh, birth of something strange and new, at least at times. Um, so yeah, I, I think anyone who, who's uh, a fan of Morris Santayana, um, should absolutely, uh, give this one a shot because it, it, it really fills in, uh, his past in a way that illuminates his future as well. Well, thank you to Abraham for a fascinating little chat. I, I'm really enjoying the deep dives because uh, I get to do them. But uh, if there is a series that you think we should really focus on, then do drop us a line at thrillcast at 2000ad.com and we'll see what we can do. Thank you to Abraham. Thank you to Helen. Thank you to Rob. And thank you to John for taking the time to be part of the podcast. Um, if you're enjoying this, let us know. Do share the word uh, about uh, the 2000ad thrillcast lockdown tapes so much good feedback about that bolland mcmahon and gibbons episode really glad you enjoyed that one um i was a little nervous about how it was going to go down but uh yeah loads and loads of uh, people saying just how much they enjoyed it i'd love to get them back i'll ask them i'll see what they say um but until next time earthlets uh enjoy the bank holiday weekend 
make sure you get the Smash special when it comes out next week. Don't forget, you can jump on board if you're not regularly reading 2000 AD uh, with Prog 2184. After it, we've got more interviews, more to come from the 2000 AD Forecast Lockdown tapes. So until then, stay safe, look after each other, and we'll see you next time. Splendid for three. Alert! 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 Fill power levels dangerously high. Alert! Alert! Read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or newsagent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com.